Welcome to Writing Correct Sentences, Part 1. This part, which is the first of three planned tutorials, is on the simple family of sentences. It's presented by the Osceola Campus Writing Center of Valencia College. The first thing you need to know to write correct sentences is that correct sentences are important. Sentences are the way we present our ideas, and the whole point of writing is to express your ideas to somebody else. Incorrect sentences confuse the reader because things aren't where they belong. They don't know what's happening. They don't know who's doing the action. They don't know anything. It gets confusing if the sentences are not written correctly. Correctly constructed sentences help the reader make sense of what you are saying. Now, some people say they don't want to interfere with the creativity, but it's up to the writer to make correct sentences that are beautiful, powerful, or interesting. You can have a beautiful sentence that doesn't make any sense, but if you have a sentence that makes sense, it's up to the writer to make it wonderful to read. Now, I don't want to use a lot of terminology. I'm into writing, not terminology, and so... We do need to have a few terms so that we understand each other, or so that at least you understand me as we go through these tutorials. The first word is verb. The verb is what many consider the most important word in any sentence or clause. It's the one the sentence revolves around. It's the center of the action. It's the center of the existence of what's happening in the sentence. It indicates an action or a state of being, a state of isness. It also organizes time for the reader, past, present, future. It allows the reader to know when the action or the idea occurred or what's going on. The next is a subject. We want to know what the sentence is about. The subject is the who or the what that is or is that is or is doing the verb. It's almost always a noun, a noun phrase, or a pronoun. Offhand, I can't think of the subject as being anything else, but I'm sure some writer somewhere either has or will come up with a sentence that has something else acting as the subject of the sentence couple more important terms, and now we're getting to the crux of how sentences are constructed correctly. A clause. A clause is a group of words containing both a subject and a verb. You may think of a sentence as being something containing a subject and a verb, but it's not quite that simple. Think for now, think of a clause as being a group of words containing both a subject and a verb. There are two kinds of clauses, and it's very important that you distinguish clearly between the two in your mind. An independent clause is a clause that makes sense by itself and can stand on its own as a sentence. Sometimes teachers or other people will call that the main clause of a sentence. There are also dependent clauses. A dependent clause is just what the name says. It needs or depends upon something else to make a complete statement. Usually it's introduced by a subordinating word of some kind. And sometimes dependent clauses are called subordinate clauses. Let me give you some examples of the two kinds of clauses and maybe that will help. Independent clauses first. In all the examples during this tutorial, the subject is in blue and the verb is in red. These are the two important words you need to find in every clause, the verb in red being the most important one. The cat sleeps on the carpet. 
You find the verb sleeps. You ask who or what slept or sleeps. The cat. The same with her name is Maria and the girl lost her cell phone. Now let's see if we can turn them into dependent clauses. You'll see it's very simple. While the cat sleeps on the carpet, although her name is Maria, after the girl lost her cell phone, as you can see, with the dependent clauses, they don't make sense all by themselves. You keep waiting for more information. What happened while the cat sleeps on the carpet? What happened although her name is Maria? What happened after the girl lost her cell phone? Sentences have the first letter capitalized and end with a period. But clauses are just groups of words with a subject and a verb. Notice that changing the first letter to a capital and adding a period turns an independent clause into a simple sentence. But when you try it with a dependent clause, the result makes no sense at all. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about clauses. What does that have to do with sentences? There are two very important points that will clarify this. All sentences are constructed of one or more clauses in various combinations. Also, all sentences must contain at least one independent clause. There are two types of sentence, two families of se sentence types. There's the simple sentence family and the complex sentence family. This tutorial will only deal with the simple family. Here we go, the simple sentence family. In the simple family, there are two kinds of sentences. Simple sentences, we've already talked about them a little bit in passing, and compound sentences. Simple sentences, the way the name implies, consist of only one independent clause, properly punctuated. That's the period at the end, the capital at the beginning. Compound sentences, on the other hand, consist of two or more independent clauses, properly joined, but also properly punctuated. Simple family sentences contain only independent clauses. We'll talk more about dependent clauses when we get to the complex family of sentences, but for now, simple family sentences are, contain, have only independent clauses, and that's what makes them up. We'll look at each of these in more detail simple sentences and compound sentences. A simple sentence is basically a single independent clause that begins with a capital letter and ends with a period or other end mark. The cat sleeps on the carpet is an independent clause. It becomes the cat sleeps on the carpet. The only difference, the capital letter and the period at the end. No matter how many other words, adjectives, adverbs, prepositional phrases are added, it is still just a simple sentence. The white cat with black spots, black feet, and black tail tips sleeps quietly on the red Persian carpet in front of the roaring fire. Many students think that if its sentence is short, it's a simple sentence. If it's long, it's something else. But they couldn't be more wrong. The only thing, the way you define an independent clause is it has a single subject-verb pair. And when you have one independent clause, you then have a simple sentence. There are many reasons to use simple sentences. They are very useful in the, the most elegant writing. They can be used for clarity because they allow the reader to focus on just one idea at a time. They can give emphasis. When you're using more complicated sentences, compound sentence and sentences and members of the complex family, 
when you suddenly shift to a simple sentence, that clarity all of a sudden gives it additional emphasis. And some writers vary the pacing or the rhythm of how the reader reads through the paragraphs or the paper by pacing the sentences. And they'll use simple sentences to do that. They can be very useful in very good writing. However, if all you use are simple sentences, your writing can sound juvenile like a first grade reader. It can be choppy or sing song. See Spot Run as an example. Spot is a dog and on and on. In addition to that, some ideas belong together. And this leads us to the second member of the simple family of sentences. Remember what it was called? Compound sentences. Compound sentence is defined as two or more independent clauses properly joined. Her name is Maria is an independent clause. The girl lost her cell phone is an independent clause. It becomes, when you join them together, her name is Maria and she lost her cell phone. Now notice, the phrase the girl was changed to she to make it read more smoothly. Grammatically, the clauses are identical. The most important phrase in the definition above is that they are properly joined. Now this isn't as hard as it seems. There are only two proper ways to join the independent clauses in a compound sentence, and we will deal with each of them in turn. The first way, and the most common, is to, to join two independent clauses, is to connect them with a coordinating conjunction preceded by a comma. Now, it's not hard to, to learn what all the coordinating conjunctions are. Because in the entire English language, with its millions of words, there are only seven coordinating conjunctions. And their first letters spell the word fanboys. So if you can remember the one word fanboys, it'll help you remember the seven coordinating conjunctions. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Simple enough. If you notice, the above sentence that starts with there are only seven is a compound sentence with two independent clauses. There are only seven coordinating conjunctions. Their first letters spell the word fanboys, are joined by the word and and preceded by a comma. But they just work better together. I could have made them two simple sentences, but they work better as a compound sentence. Let me give you some more examples of compound sentences. Her name is Maria, and she lost her cell phone. We already talked about that. But let's see what happens with some of the other coordinating conjunctions. The cat sleeps on the carpet, but the dog sleeps outside. The day was ugly with rain, yet it was necessary to end the drought. He sat down at the table with rude haste, for he hadn't eaten since the day before. Notice each of those consists of two independent clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction preceded by a comma. There is a second way, as I mentioned, and this is one which is too often misused, and that is to join them with just a semicolon. The day was ugly with rain, semicolon. It was beautiful at the end of the long drought. Here we don't have a coordinating conjunction. We just have the two independent clauses joined by the semicolon. If you like, you can also use a transitional word followed by a comma, but you can't use a coordinating conjunction when you're using a semicolon. The day was ugly with rain, semicolon. However, it was beautiful at the end of the long drought. 
Each of those sentences has a very slightly different feel to it, but they're both correct. And they are both independent clauses joined by just a semicolon. Now, when does a writer choose to use one, the coordinating conjunction preceded by a comma, rather than the other, the semicolon? The writer uses a coordinating conjunction, one of the fanboys, preceded by a comma, when the writer wants just to join the two ideas. They're two separate ideas, but they work pretty nicely together, as in the sentences I've used in the past. And it just reads better that way. It's, it breaks up the rhythm. It does all sorts of things. And it ties things together. However, you use a semicolon when the two ideas are so closely joined that they're interrelated. They really only make sense together. Kind of like being married. To summarize... All sentences must contain at least one independent clause. That's very important. If you don't have an independent clause, you only have part of a sentence, and that's called a fragment. We'll deal with those in the third tutorial in this series. Simple sentences are made up of one independent clause. Only one. Compound sentences are made up of two or more independent clauses, but they must be properly joined. Now, that's not hard because there are only two ways to properly join them. With a coordinating conjunction, one of the fanboys, preceded by a comma, or, when, the, when it's called for, just a semicolon. Thank you for your attention. The next tutorial will deal with the complex family of sentences.